So did you guys have a good Thanksgiving? Look around. Isn't this pretty cool? Come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> well, it's all right. As I saw our kids up here singing, I was just moved by how far our church has come in a very short period of time to see that we have enough kids to even put up on stage. And that's pretty awesome. So there's a lot to be thankful for. All right, before I get started this morning, I want to tell you about next week. Next week, we start a different kind of sermon series than we've ever done since we started. We're doing Christmas at the movies. So we're going to kick off with my personal favorite Christmas movie at this point, which is Elf. So if you, who all has seen Elf? And we're going to watch pieces of it tomorrow. So if you hadn't, you might go ahead this week and, and treat yourself to that and get ready. You're going to want to be here in person. If you watch online, and I'm talking to the people online too, you won't get to see the movie clips because of copyright issues. So we'll have to black that part out and you'll just kind of hear, or you won't even hear the movie clips. You'll just kind of hear a little blank screen and some music until we get back. So you want to be here for that. We're going to kick that off. We even have popcorn, so that's worth the, the trip in for. Thanksgiving is a time when it's usually pretty easy to have gratitude. We're surrounded often by friends and family. We have lots of good food to eat. We have a weekend of activities and football, go Cowboys, all lined up. That's why I heard somebody clap. There's one Cowboy fan out there. We have all of those things around us. And so it's often easy to be thankful at that time of year. But you know, that's not how the Thanksgiving holiday got its start. The original Thanksgiving was celebrated in Plymouth, Massachusetts after a winter when almost half the pilgrims had died and they were still experiencing really harsh conditions and they gave time to thank God for the blessings that they had. And then it became a national holiday in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War where about 620,000 Americans were killed. And then it moved to its current date uh, in the late 1930s kind of at the end of the Great Depression. So this holiday is steeped in hardship and suffering and difficulty. And, and that kind of makes sense because that's when gratitude is most important. Gratitude's pretty easy when things are going well, but it's those moments when things are tough that if we can have a different perspective, if we can find gratitude in those moments, it will give us peace and contentment in life. That's also the kind of gratitude that gets God's attention. You know, I think God appreciates gratitude when he gives us big blessings, but man, the gratitude that gets his attention is when we are grateful and we praise him even in the storms, even when things are difficulty. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to Philippians chapter four. We're wrapping up our sermon series centered where we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Philippians. And we've been talking about how the core of the gospel is what we should center our lives around. And we're gonna continue to talk about that today. This book of Philippians is actually a letter by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. It was written about 60 to 62 AD. So about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And Paul had actually started this church about 12 years before he writes this letter. So he's writing this letter to a church that he knows pretty well. What's funny is when we planned out this sermon series about seven months ago, we didn't even think about the last week of the sermon series being Thanksgiving weekend. We're not that bright. So we planned it all out. And then a few weeks ago, we started looking at planning this service that you're a part of. And we went, oh my goodness, I wonder if the passage of scripture is set up for Thanksgiving. Well, we may not have thought about this day seven months ago, but God did. And what you're going to see is that Philippians chapter 4 is the perfect scripture for Thanksgiving. In fact, it's got the word Thanksgiving in it. Look at Philippians 4, 4 through 12. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is Near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, there's that word, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things." Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. 
I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Man, if that's not Thanksgiving, I don't know what is. You know, I was actually talking through this sermon out loud Thanksgiving morning. I was kind of practicing it and getting ready, and my wife heard it, and when I was finished, she said, that's a pretty tough sermon for Thanksgiving. And I thought, well, that's odd. I don't really, I'm talking about gratitude. That's not a tough sermon. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about being thankful. I said, you know, a tough sermon, sweetie, is where I'm really giving tough truth to the church and challenging them to live their lives in a different way. And then as soon as I said it, I realized that's exactly what I'm doing today. I'm giving you some tough truth and I'm challenging you to live your life in a different way. And here's why. No matter how much I would like to, I can't change your circumstances. I, I can't do that for you. But what I can do is help you change the lens through which you view your circumstances. And if you can change the lens through which you view your circumstances and find this secret that Paul is talking about, it will change your life. It's a really big deal because you can then find contentment and peace no matter what's going on. And at the end of this sermon, I'm going to give you a seven-day challenge. I'm going to call it the seven-day gratitude challenge. And I think there's a tendency when you hear these kind of things in a sermon to kind of just kind of blow it off, think, well, that's just part of his message. He's just kind of talking about it for emphasis. I'm really not. When we get to that, I want you to seriously consider changing the way you do things for seven days because I believe that if you do that, you'll start to see little changes. And then if you see a little change and you continue it, I, I believe that it will change your life and it will increase the peace and the joy that you experience. All right, let's try to figure out Paul's secret as we go through this sermon. Look back at verse four. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It's that word always that's tough. It's that always that's kind of the focus of this passage. He's saying rejoice always. Don't rejoice sometimes. Don't rejoice most of the time, but rejoice always. When things are awesome, rejoice. When you're on top of the mountain, rejoice. When things are difficult, rejoice. When you're in the very deepest, darkest place in your life, rejoice. That's what he's talking about. And if this sounds like a tough assignment from the Apostle Paul, remember, he wrote these words from prison where he was probably chained to a Roman guard. And so in that moment where he is sitting in a tiny prison cell, chained to a Roman guard, he rejoices in the Lord, and then he challenges us to rejoice in the Lord. And here's why he did it, because he understands that life doesn't always go the way we want it to. It doesn't always work out the way we had planned, and he understood that. You guys have all seen the, the great old Disney movie, The Lion King, right? You've seen that, everybody? Yeah, do you remember the great line from Mufasa's brother, Scar? And he says it to uh, Simba. And he says at one point, life's not fair, is it, Simba? You remember that? I love that line. I use that with my kids when they're fussing. Sometimes when my youngest, Taylor, is fussing about some little thing that didn't go her way, I'll say, life's not fair, is it, Taylor? Now, I'm not sure that it helps anything, and it manages to irritate the fire out of her, but it sure makes me chuckle when I do it. So you can use that, you can take that parenting advice, use it with your own kids, they're gonna love it. In fact, just tell people you got that parenting advice right here at Karis City Church, and it's just, it's free. Actually, don't, don't tell them that, that's probably not good advice. But there is truth to that statement because sometimes it feels like life's not fair, like things aren't going the way you expected them to. And the difficulty is this. I think sometimes we think when we follow Jesus that life's gonna be all beach parties and proms, but it's not. It doesn't change the difficulty in life. And sometimes it even makes things more difficult. Trouble and difficulty are guarantees in this life. You, you don't have to go looking for them. They're gonna find you. But gratitude is harder to find. It is something you have to go looking for, and then you have to choose it. See, there are times when praising God and having gratitude is easy. When you get a promotion or a raise at work, 
And gratitude is easy. When the baby starts sleeping through the night, gratitude is easy. When you ask your girlfriend to marry you, well, and she says yes, <laughs> gratitude is easy. On Christmas morning, when business is booming, when the medical test comes back negative, gratitude is easy. But when tragedy strikes or a loved one is sick, the gratitude that was so easy at a different point in time becomes very difficult. Gratitude is difficult when you don't feel like you're getting the help that you think you need and somebody else is getting it, or you're going through a divorce. Gratitude is difficult. When you lose your job or money is tight or your kid is missing this Thanksgiving and you don't understand what went wrong or you're without a loved one for the first time this Thanksgiving, it may feel like in those moments that gratitude is impossible. But the Apostle Paul seems to have found gratitude and praise in each and every circumstance. And look, we can take a lot of lesson from this because this dude did not have an easy life. He was shipwrecked at least three different times. He was bitten by poisonous snakes. He was beaten and thrown in jail on a regular basis. He was stoned and left for dead. He floated out on the open sea for days at one point in time. So dude knows what he's talking about when he says to have gratitude in all circumstances. Look back at what he says in verse 12. He says, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Isn't that the goal for us? Like if we know that difficulty and hardship are gonna come, isn't that the secret that we, we want to know? We want to understand how to have contentment and joy and fulfillment and gratitude in those moments. Like, wouldn't it be awesome to be able to have peace and gratitude no matter what's going on? Somebody cuts you off in traffic and gives you the your, your number one sign. Man, it doesn't even phase you. You just wave and tell them Jesus loves them, which is probably just going to irritate them even more. But wouldn't it be neat when the kids decide to break two dozen eggs to make a slip and slide in the kitchen? And it doesn't even phase you. Isn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? To have that kind of an attitude. That's the goal. So how do we learn Paul's secret? What does it look like? So here it is. Here is the secret that Paul's talking about. It's having confidence and truly knowing that the Lord is near. He reminds us of that fact in this passage of Scripture. In verse 5, he says, the Lord is near. What does that look like? It means we have such a trust and a faith in God that no matter what's going on, we know that God is going through it with us and he knows that ultimately from an eternal perspective, he has your best interest in heart. It's knowing that no matter what comes through that door, you're ready for it because you're with God. I trust God. I rely on him. I know that he is with me. He is in control. And then when you know that, you choose gratitude. Robert Emmons is the author of a book called Gratitude Works. And here's what he says about this choice of gratitude. He says, it is vital to make a distinction between feeling grateful and being grateful. Being grateful is a choice, a prevailing attitude that endures and is relatively immune to the gains and losses that flow in and out of our lives. When disaster strikes, gratitude provides a perspective from which we can view life in its entirety and not be overwhelmed by temporary circumstances. Yes, this is hard to achieve, but my research says it is worth the effort. So you're probably thinking, okay, that's great, Nathan, but how do we do that? How do we choose gratitude when life feels anything but grateful? Well, Paul's going to explain that to us. Look back at verses 6 through 7. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look back at the first verse again. Do not be anxious about anything. In other words, he says, don't worry. Now, if Paul didn't give us more information than just that, that'd just be a little irritating <laughs> because that's really not an instruction. That's a result that we may not know how to achieve. It's like saying, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about that. Like when my golf instructor one time years ago said, just hit the ball straight down the fairway. Like, okay, well, that's great but I don't know how to do that. But Paul doesn't stop there. He doesn't leave us hanging with that. He's going to give us an illustration or a formula 
that is going to help us avoid worry and find peace. He says, in every situation, give thanks, no matter what's going on in your life. To do that, we have to remind ourselves some, sometimes that we have so much to be thankful for. Give thanks to God for cooler days. We've had a few of those here. Give thanks to God for sunsets and rain and rainbows, the little simple things that are such a blessing from God. Give God thanks for a good meal. You know a good meal is a gift from God? God didn't have to make food taste good. He didn't have to do that. He could have made it all taste like Brussels sprouts. And if you're here and you like Brussels sprouts, I don't understand it. Brussels sprouts are not food. Brussels sprouts are what food eats. Think about that. <laughs> but I want to give you an illustration of how amazing a gift food is. My favorite food is bacon. I love bacon. Bacon should not taste good. It just shouldn't. If you know anything about pigs, how they live and how they eat, bacon should not taste good. If you've ever slopped a pig, and I've done that many times, if you slop a pig, you watch them, you pour that nasty mix of food into their trough, and they stick their whole heads under it and just let it run all down their backs, and, and it's, they stink, they live in the mud. Bacon should not taste good, and yet it does. Bacon makes everything better. It does. It'll make life better. <laughs> But let me raise that one. Think about bacon's breakfast partner, the egg. Think about an egg tasting good. Think about where an egg comes from. Picture that in your mind. God is good. Now, get that image out of your mind if you're going to eat deviled eggs later on at lunch. We have so many amazing gifts that we take for granted. And the trick of being grateful is looking beyond those gifts and seeing the giver and giving thanks to the giver of those gifts to see that all around us, those gifts are good no matter what's going on in our temporary circumstances. So let me give you a few practical tips to help you become more grateful in your life. First, choose it. And I know that sounds simple, but it's not. Choose it. There are people who are just naturally gracious. They, 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 they see the good in everything. But most of us, and I'm in this category, we don't. We have to work at it. Remember, gratitude is not about good things happening to you. It's about seeing the good in what's happening to you. Find the blessings and give thanks for those. Choose it. All right, here's a biggie. Stop focusing on what you don't have and start focusing on what you do have. You know, some of the richest people in the world are some of the most unhappy because they never think about what they have. They're always thinking about what they haven't gotten yet. Gratitude does not come from the next raise or promotion or more money or more success or more fame. It comes from being thankful for what you have and seeing the beauty in what God has done. And then joy comes from a grateful heart. All right, here, here's another way to increase gratitude. Spend time serving people that are less fortunate than you. Do you realize that half the world lives on $8 a day or less? Think about that. Think about how blessed you are. Half the world lives on $8 or less a day. So if you want more gratitude, go with us to serve the homeless when we go and, and see what it looks like to not have a place to go and sleep at night. And it'll make you more grateful for the blessings in your life. Here's the last thing, and this is where the seven-day challenge comes in. Take time every day to pray prayer filled with thanksgiving. Think about all the blessings of your life. And here's, here's the challenge. Instead of bookending your day with social media that frustrates you or anxiety-filling news where you read about or watch all the horrible things in the world, instead of booking in your, your day with that, book in your day with thanksgiving. And, and so in the morning, take three minutes to just give God thanks for different blessings in your life. Again, sunsets, rainbows, beautiful mountain views, trips you've taken, things that are, you're grateful for. You can do that on the way to work. You can do it on the way to school or when you're running errands, but take three minutes every morning to give God thanks and do nothing but praise him and give him thanks for the blessings in your life. And, and then at night, just before you go to bed, I wanna challenge you to think about three things unique to that day 
that you're thankful for. Maybe that's a conversation that you were worried about that went better than you expected. Maybe it's something the kids accomplished at school that day. Maybe it's just you thought about your spouse and how much of a blessing they are. Or you thought about some family members or or Thanksgiving or something unique to that day that you're thankful for. And then take three minutes praying for that. Now, here's the hard part of the one-week challenge. In that moment... Also, think about the difficulty in your life, those things that are troubling, that are hurtful, that are depressing, that are sad, and find things to be thankful for, even in that circumstance. Do that three minutes in the morning, three minutes in the evening. Try this for one week, seven days, and see if it doesn't start to make a little difference in the way you view the world around you. And if it's making a difference, then stretch it out and do it for 30 days and see if you don't begin to see gratitude differently than you did before. Here's why it's so important to give thanks even in the difficult circumstances. Paul says, put all of your troubles before God. He says, lay them out there for God. Tell him what you want. Tell him what you need. But do it with thanksgiving. Here's where I think we go wrong in this prayer we start making a list of all the things we need God to fix. One, two, three, four. And really all we're doing is listing out things for us to worry about. We might not even have thought of about a couple of them if we hadn't started making the list. But but here's where we're going wrong. We're not giving thanksgiving. We're not finding reasons even in those circumstances to, to pray and to thank God. Paul says that we're not just supposed to ask for a change in our circumstances but we're supposed to give thanks in our circumstances. Do you see the difference? Pray to God for the circumstances to change, but find things to be thankful for. We we can't just wait impatiently for things to get better. We have to choose gratitude while we wait on God. Whatever difficulty we're going through, there are things to be thankful for. If you're struggling with a major medical problem or you got family that's struggling with a major medical problem, give thanks if you're in Houston that you're in one of the places that's the best place in the world to get that kind of medical care. If one of your kids is making bad decisions and they're messing up their life, be thankful that you have kids because so many people today are sad because they can't have children. Even if you're dying, give God thanks that you have the hope of heaven, that you have this amazing eternity planned for you. We need to be thankful and God, praise God even if God doesn't change our circumstances or take away the storms. Because that's going to go a long way to help us see the world differently and find peace and joy in those circumstances. Then when you conquer worry and fear, you can begin to rejoice in everything. And that leads to contentment. You know, lots of studies by non-Christian organizations, by medical uh, groups, psychological groups, have done studies that show that lives filled with gratitude make life better. There was a 2015 article in Newsweek that was citing a bunch of different medical studies and they talked about how physically we do better when we live lives filled with gratitude. They talked about how mentally and psychologically we do better. They cite a study from 2006 on Vietnam veterans that showed that Vietnam veterans that live lives filled with gratitude are way better at dealing with their post-traumatic stress disorder and the problems that they carry. They also found a different study that people with neuromuscular diseases who kept gratitude journeys, journals reported a way better sense of health and well-being. There was a recent article published less than a year ago in December of 2022 by the Mayo Clinic, and it reports that people who express regular gratitude t- tend to sleep better. It also reported that they have better immune systems, less depression, less chronic pain. And listen to this last one. They have better health. They're less likely to get diseases. In other words, if you're thankful for the health that you do have, you're less likely to get sick with something else. These findings are pretty remarkable. These aren't Christian organizations. But Paul said the same thing 2,000 years ago. He said, pray with thanksgiving and ask God to change your circumstances. Or if he doesn't change your circumstances, to give you strength to deal with those circumstances. It's a tough prayer because we desperately want things to get better. We desperately want things to change. But here's the hard truth that my wife was talking about. They may not. And even if they do, 
It may take longer than you hoped or you expected. That's why it's so important to find gratitude and give thanks in every circumstance. That's why this seven day challenge is such a big deal. Begin to give thanks in your circumstances and it will change the way you view the world. I wanna wrap up with 13 words from the Bible that I believe sum up this message. And if this is a passage of scripture, maybe you need to read it every day and remind yourself because it kind of sums up my entire message. Look at this, this is from 1 Chronicles 16, 24. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Sums it up, give thanks to the Lord. What part of your life, what part of your thought life and your prayer life involves giving thanks to God? For he is good. Remind yourself, he is good. He loves you. He has an eternity plan for you. Even if it feels like he's not near right now, he is planning for you. He wants a relationship with you. He died for you. He is good. His love endures forever. It endures through the ups and the downs of life. His love endures when bank accounts are low and stress is high. His love endures when we are sick or when we're just sick and tired. The secret is this, give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances and find contentment and joy. Let's pray.